Well, hello. Thank you for joining me today. I'm really excited because I've got Dr. Kate Rayon Blue here with me. Am I pr pronouncing that right? Yes, perfectly. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know about perfectly, but I'm really excited because I've been following Dr. Rayon Blue's um, work now for, for many years, and she wrote a very pivotal book, which we're going to talk about, on the topic of vitamin K2 and how it applies to your good health. Kate, thank you so much for joining me today. You're welcome. Very glad to be here. Kate, I wanted to go a little bit back to the start because you've been in this space for a while and it's become a little bit more trendy to talk about. But I want, I want to go back to where you kind of first got into this, um, this space of, of talking about vitamin K2, how you first came about it and where you felt the compelling, where you felt compelled to write a book on it. Why do you think people um, you know, needed to know about this? Well, I came across information about K2 in the early 2000s, and I was amazed. At this point, I had graduated from naturopathic medical school. I had done my residency, and I started coming across some research papers, and I thought, how is it that there is a nutrient that I haven't learned about in all of my tra professional training uh, with regards to nutrition? And we learned a little bit about vitamin K as a blood clotting vitamin, of course, but then here was this whole other body of information about vitamin K2, so a different form of vitamin K, first of all, that seemed to have profound benefits in the body, and yet nobody was talking about it. And so I kind of got hooked on that. And around the same time, I had read uh, Weston Price's uh, pivotal work, of course. Uh, actually, I'd, been, I'd explored exploring a lot of his work, but nutrition and physical regeneration. And and eventually, uh, thanks to an article by Chris Masterjohn, who you know, much respect is uh, also a, a leading K2 expert, um, realized the connection between Price's work, Activator X, Vitamin K2. And I also, there was more research coming out at that time about potential dangers of calcium, for example, calcium supplements. And K2 was just sort of provided the missing piece to the puzzle of so many health concerns. And it was clearly a nutrient that was lacking from our diet, uh, lacking in terms of awareness in our understanding and nutrition. And it's, you know, that was many years ago now, we're just, just still, I think, starting to get there in terms of awareness. It's a remarkable story, isn't it? That there's this really powerful nutrient that nearly no one hears about. And you, you have to kind of really step back and kind of think about the gravity of that. But the, the elements that you're kind of talking about are this kind of, yeah, this, this breakthrough moment where you realize that, hang on, there's all this research sitting around talking about these physio physiological processes, discussing of what K2 does. And then there's this very old research. Now, just mm -hmm. to clarify, so did, were you reading about K2 before Master John wrote the article or was that kind of, because um, it was 2007 you originally wrote the article right. connecting Activate X to, to K2. So were you looking at before and then this kind of dropped? Well, so I had read uh, Nutrition and Physical Degeneration. Um, some, you know, I think it got maybe was during my residency. And then about six months after, then I'd put it aside. It was an interesting book, you know, huge book. And I put it aside and always, you know, kept in the back of my brain. And then I started to uh, come across these articles about vitamin K2. And actually, as soon as I read about it, my first thought was, oh, you know, Price talked about that in his book. So I went running to get my copy and look through and look through and like, I don't see anything about K2 here. And I didn't actually make that connection. Thank goodness, because I was honestly almost on the verge of losing sleep over it because it was driving me crazy when I read Chris Masterjohn's article. And thank you, Chris, for putting me out of my misery because I was like, oh, of course. <laughs> That's why I was convinced he had talked about it. But then it wasn't there, uh, at least not by the name vitamin K2. He, of course, refers to it as Activator X. Uh, and then I was hooked because I thought, you know what, that we've got this growing body of modern evidence, plus this really interesting backstory, this historical uh, evidence. And um, if you didn't think that the you know history of a vitamin could be interesting, it, this is this is one that's really interesting. So interesting. Like uh, I was the same process. Like it felt like there was something Price was talking about, but Price himself, you could tell, was kind of tangled up by this. He was so a little yeah. bit troubled that he couldn't, yeah. he couldn't put the final piece in and he unfortunately died. And, and, but it's kind of intuitively there, right? And it, it's strange that you kind of had that where you thought you'd seen it in his work and went back and it's not there. Yeah. 
and it drove me nuts. But fortunately, uh, you know, m you know, Master John was able to piece that together, and uh, and off we went. <laughs> Tell me about your um your your first kind of perceptions reading nutrition and physical degeneration. Like what would you because it's a very kind of it, it throws a lot of things at you. So like what do you think you you were you were taking out of what Price is trying to to tell us? It does throw a lot of things at you, and of course it goes down rabbit holes. It's not edited the way a modern day book might be, and there's sort of you know the there's anthropological parts and the fascinating aspects of even traveling to the four corners of the globe at that time, a unique time in history. And there, so there's a lot to it, but really that concept of uh, what were people eating? What, what did healthy people eat? Because I think that when we lose our culture around food, which many of us have, then that can become usurped by all kinds of theories about what you should eat. Uh, and, and we tend to be prone to these extreme diets one way or another. And so the concept of actually looking at healthy people, what they were eating, and then as well, you know, taking a crack at what nutrients might be found in those diets, and not to be reductionist, but that's important information too, was really just a paradigm shift in terms of understanding nutrition and, and not even... Uh, you know, par, you know, what I would consider partially idealistic or fabricated notions of what a an ancestral diet or a paleo diet, for example, might be, but actually looking at what people are eating. And he really did that at a time when uh, you can't really do that anymore. Like those groups, for the most part, are are gone. Of course, there's still a few around the world, but that is amazing to have that documentation. Yeah, totally agree. It's like this interface between the modern and traditional diet that we've nearly, it's nearly all been blurred now. And he was mm -hmm. kind of running around and, and documenting it yet. Mm -hmm. We've, and today we don't even have the perception of, you know, that there were people eating different things. Now it's, it's maybe become a little bit more topical with the paleo movement and so forth. Yep. Right. But, but actually what were they doing? And right. these are relatively modern people too, you know, in terms of their, their, they're still living in traditional societies, but they, mm -hmm. um, they, they live in relatively modern ways, you know, cooking grains and so forth. Um, mm -hmm. but it's still a di very different diet to what we eat. And, you know, I think it's, you, you, you sum it up so well that it's this, it's looking at that pinpoint view of what was happening as we modernize the diet. And then yeah. For me, as in dental training, I was kind of like, "Wow!" Like, like as I started to realize what he was showing, I was like, "This is what I'm seeing in my practice every day." It's crazy yeah. when you think right. about it. Yeah. Yes, and I really love that aspect of things. You know, I don't have a dental background, and I'm always really stoked about dentists who get it because it's so important. And yet, that does seem to be dismissed to you know um, by with conventional you know dental uh, practice. Maybe that's changing. Um, but the health of the mouth as reflective of the whole body, et cetera. But I think that is an area that has completely, it's, it's the furthest behind in terms of research uh, when it comes to K2. Yeah, that, that's true. It's just starting to bubble up now because there's kind of enough um, people in the research sphere that are starting to see the K2. Hang on, this is really, really important. Mm -hmm. I think in the next few years, we're going to see some kind of landslide papers that tells some very interesting things, but yeah, it's, it's a very disparate picture. So like dentists today to, to put this price story, you know, into, into place, you have to do a lot of different things to kind of help it drop. And there's some things that we are missing in our core training K2 specifically that would make mm -hmm. the whole thing so much easier. <laughs> yeah. Right. So that's what I'm really looking forward to kind of um, getting like picking your brain about is how do we really understand what this K2 does? And so your book is titled The Calcium Paradox. And so it really kind of sums up the, you know, the, the core problem at, with um, you know, having a lack of K2. Can you explain the calcium paradox um, for people that, that aren't familiar with, mm -hmm. with your work? So the calcium paradox was the jumping off point of the book, because around the same time I was learning about K2, there were these studies coming out saying that people who take calcium supplements have 20 to 30 percent more heart attacks and strokes than those who don't take calcium supplements. And that was really shocking. It's not just one, but several studies at this 
a point and everybody takes calcium supplements. I mean, even a, a, a doctor, for example, who won't recommend a multivitamin will recommend calcium and vitamin D to their patient. And, and the concept was that all women should be taking this. And to learn that that may have had harmful effects, uh, but then you ask, well, then what do we do? Um, do we give up calcium? Uh, what if, and of course what's happening is it, it, part of the calcium that we've been taking in, and that happens whether you're getting it from supplements or food, that's, that's the important thing. It, it ha seems to be exacerbated with supplements, but some of that calcium will not end up in your bones and teeth where you want it to, but end up in arteries and other soft tissues where it can be harmful, dangerous, even deadly. And so that the fact that calcium is a double-edged sword, the fact that we do need it in the body, uh, but need it in the right places, that's the starting point of that book, that calcium paradox. And ultimately, it's not an either or question when it comes to calcium. Uh, we need a certain amount of it in our bodies at all times for our heart to beat, for our nerves to fire, for everything to happen. Uh, but uh, we've and, and it does have a tendency to deposit in the wrong places. And we've always had a system to keep that in check but that system requires a couple of nutrients, but really vitamin K2 is the biggest one. And so it's not should you or should you supplement with calcium because you're getting calcium in through your diet, it's already in your body, um, but how do you keep it in its place? And that's really a big, uh, that's, that's the biggest role that we know of for vitamin K2. Uh, and of course, now many people take vitamin D, which is a good thing, we need that, but that will cause you to absorb calcium uh, to, you know, to no limit and doesn't, again, control where the calcium goes. That initial body of evidence you're referring, was that just calcium supplements? Or, because there was also um, research that was coming out on D3 and calcium, right? And the some of the research talking about the effects on um, uh, bone density and how it wasn't effective. And then there was this connection. Uh, is, that, is that the research that you're, that you're quoting? The, those studies looking at maybe calcium wasn't as effective as we thought for preventing fractures is more recent. And that's in a way another sort of begs the question of, as to why we're taking calcium at all. Um, but the initial studies in terms of calcium potentially being harmful, I think we're looking primarily just at calcium supplement takers, uh, but they did replicate that in a few studies looking at an increase in heart attack and stroke risk, but they didn't evaluate in those initial studies whether what the benefits potentially were. And can you just explain um, for people that might be a bit confused as to how calcium might connect to um, risk of cardiovascular disease? Mm -hmm. So when we talk about hardening of the arteries, that literally is, it can manifest either from, um, you know, from a mild stiffening of the arteries to actual blockages of certain arteries. And that happens due to deposition of calcium. Um, and this is something that can be measured on certain types of scans. They're, they're not commonly available scans, uh, at least here in Canada. I don't know about, I imagine Australia is probably the same thing. You can get them in uh, the States, you know, you can pay and, and get that. But basically, you know, when it comes to heart health, we've been so focused on cholesterol. Um, but cholesterol really is not a great predictor of our risk of heart attack and stroke, for example, but the amount of calcium you have in your arteries is quite a good predictor. And so we know when it comes to heart health, heart disease, calcium's a problem, but if calcium's getting into the wrong places, it's not calcium's fault. And so it's not a matter of whether we should or shouldn't take calcium. Well, that's actually a separate question now if it's not helpful, but um, it's more, again, about how to keep calcium in the right places. Yeah, and makes makes total sense when we start to think about going back to Price's work. He was saying, like, well, if you eat these foods, the body seems to deposit calcium and minerals into bones and teeth. And what mm -hmm. we're seeing is this research playing out saying, oh, when uh, in certain situations, the body doesn't use calcium right. And so it's just amazing that Price's work is just kind of coming out in this modern research, you know, the way you describe it so well. Okay, so... We found this research that's um, where calcium uh, is going into the wrong places. Can you explain a little bit about the um, the, the the papers that you found that were um, talking about this mechanism of K two and, and what vitamin K two is and what it does? Mm -hmm. So actually, the very earliest research that was done on K2 and the first studies I came across, in fact, weren't related to bone health or cardiovascular health, uh, but cancer research being done in Japan. 
in particular on a, a number of different types of cancer. And then, then that sort of, uh, and there still is ongoing research, particularly with regards to prostate cancer for men seems really helpful. Uh, breast cancer and, and, and you know there's different types but it's the cardiovascular and bone health research that seems to really be um, accelerating right now and, and more being done on that and you know this, this works on a number of levels the very simplest level you know simplest way to explain it is that k2 will guide calcium into your you know bones and teeth and keep it out of your arteries and it specifically does this, it doesn't do it directly, but specifically does this by activating protein. So like I said, we've always needed to keep calcium in check in the body. And the body has a way to do this really well and really effectively by having a system of all these proteins that will, you know, scavenge and scour calcium, direct it to one place, pull it out of another place. But uh, and there's about at least 17 of those proteins, but they more or less all require vitamin K2 to be optimally active. And if K2 is lacking, then that doesn't happen the way it should. And so you can gradually have calcium being taken out of your bones and or building up in areas where it shouldn't in, in soft tissues like arteries. So that's sort of the one of the most basic mechanisms of how K2 works. So there's basically two little proteins, isn't there, that, that it were subsequently discovered in the 70s, osteocalcin in, in the 90s, matrix GLA protein. And mm -hmm. these are the little the little guys that K2 goes around and 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 activates. For those that are uh, confused between what they commonly hear of vitamin K um, mm. and what we're talking about K2, um, can you explain uh, the, the difference in those and what they do in the body? Mm -hmm. uh, so there, there has been confusion around vitamin K because it, it's not just one nutrient, it's actually a family of nutrients like the B vitamins. You wouldn't just say take vitamin B because there's a whole lot of them. And this is, fortunately, there's really only two major ones that we need to be concerned about, K1 and K2. And K, they, they were both discovered at the same time back in the, I think it was the late 20s. And vitamin K1 is found in green leafy vegetables. Its major role in the body is in blood clotting. And blood clotting is so important that it can't be left to the whims of your diet. We have sophisticated mechanisms to recycle vitamin K1. It's almost impossible to be deficient in it through, say, lack of a dietary intake. Um, it's usually uh, secondary to some liver disease or some other problem. And at this, you know, K2 was discovered at the same time. People thought, man, they're more or less the same thing. And so K2 was ignored because we thought, it's common, easy to get in the diet, you can't be deficient. And it turns out vitamin K2, uh, it does not play a major role in blood clotting under normal circumstances. You can't get it in uh, the diet through green leafy vegetables. There's a completely different set of foods and we don't recycle it. And so you absolutely can become deficient. It's it's fascinating how, yeah, the, they, they kind of got lumped into the same group like that, right? Because the, the molecule is quite, it's similar. It's got this this obscure quinone molecule, philoquinones mm -hmm. and men menaquinones. They look very similar, but mm -hmm. yeah, the, the action in the body is completely different. Mm -hmm. Is it true that um, that vitamin K one can convert into K two in the body? In very small amounts under certain circumstances, but um, for the most part, really not enough to meet our needs. And so you can't expect to achieve your uh, or get optimal vitamin k2 levels for example from eating lots of vitamin k1 there have been studies done on that showing that the conversion isn't great and uh, you can still be deficient even if you're eating in vitamin k2 even if you're eating lots of vitamin k1 okay so let's look at what price was finding so he was finding in all these different traditional societies these really kind of specific foods and he was mm -hmm. finding that it was rich in activator x right so what were these what were these foods and so where is K2 um, stored in 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 nature and how does it get uh, into our into our diet? Mm -hmm. So two the two main food sources of vitamin K2 in our diet are first of all grass fed animal foods and secondly certain types of fermented foods some but not all and Price was focusing on these animal foods. He noticed that we ended up honing in specifically on butter and grass-fed butter. And he even charted, and I, I, I think these charts are fascinating, that the 
the um, amount of activator X in these butter samples, and he did this from all over North America and in different parts of the world, would vary according to the seasons. And in fact, it would vary according to the growth rate of the grass. And so I know the, the more the, um, as the grass was growing faster, um, animals would be getting in more vitamin K1 and these ruminants. So, you know, cows, for example, can make a really efficient conversion. The vitamin K2 ends up in the butter. And then you could chart this um, increase and decrease. So natural seasonal variation in the grass fed foods. Of course, once we removed animals from pasture and you know stopped grass feeding to the you know, large extent, then that takes it out of our diet, a major source of it out of our diet. It's fascinating, it's fascinating how this popped up. Um, so, and just the foresight to go and measure the butter through the US, it's just amazing. Um, Dr. Kate, Michael has a, a question here. What are the differing forms of vitamin K2? And he says MK4 and MK7. What do we need to know? And what foods are high in K2? I believe I've heard fermented foods produce this. Mm -hmm. Perfect timing for this question yeah, right. because that's essentially what we're talking about now. So um, there are, in nature, there are a number of different types of vitamin K2, actually, MK4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, even. Um, and you don't have to worry about, you know, getting some of each. You just, as long as it would seem, as long as you have some of one, you're okay. You will find what we call short chain or MK4 in animal foods, like grass-fed animal foods. Um, so it's a fat-soluble vitamin, so butter, egg yolks of animals that are out in the pasture, goose, liver, um, goose fat, goose seems to be higher than other poultry, for example, which isn't very high. So that's the short chain MK4. Um, and then there's the longer chain, the MK5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10. Uh, we focus on an MK7 because these two, MK4 and MK7, are commercially the two types you will find on the market. MK7 does, in nature, occur in a variety of fermented foods, including natto, which is the, one of the highest known foods, if not the highest food. Um, but you also will get MK8, 9, and 10 in a number of cheeses. And I don't know if down the road we may find out that those, in fact, are especially helpful or beneficial. But um, yes, so you can get vitamin K2 in uh, some types of fermented foods, uh, certain cheeses, not all, because some but not all bacteria have the ability to make vitamin K2. So it doesn't matter if the milk that went into the cheese is grass fed, it's de novo synthesis. So it wasn't in there to begin with, the bacteria made it. Uh, so brie, gouda, Jarlsberg, gruyere, um, certain types of blue cheeses, but not all. There's a growing list of uh, cheeses that are high in K2. And then um, natto, and there's a which is a Japanese fermented soybean food. There's also a Korean version called gojukjang. I'm sure I butchered that, but it's a similar type of food, also very high in K2 from the fermentation. Foods that are hard to pronounce and also with a funny taste. Have, have you, do you eat natto yourself or have you eaten natto? I have certainly eaten it. I have had it um, in my freezer for long periods of time. I, I really don't want to discourage. I got a little bit of hate mail um, from the nacho lovers because I wasn't encouraging enough, apparently, in my book of people to try nacho. So I do absolutely encourage you to try nacho because it, it amazes me how many people who try it and like it right off the bat. Others can learn to love it. I'm still struggling. Um, people send me recipes, all kinds of things. This is, oh, you have to have it like this. And that makes it great. So it's just, it's a unique taste and texture. Um, but you need such a small amount that whether you love it or not, you can still, you know, get it down and get your K2. Yeah. It's, a, I mean, I like the taste. It, it's a very specific taste. Some people describe it as baby diapers. Um, but, you know, it's, <laughs> it's foods like, in all of these foods that we're talking about, you know, we're talking about organ meats and, um, you know, there, there's tastes that our modern palates aren't used to. So there's kind of a, a relearning that I think people, you know, should probably appreciate a little bit is that, mm -hmm. you know, you, you may not feel that it's, um, that it tastes, you know, normal to you, but that's because mm -hmm. it's got these, these nutrients in, in the, that are so important. So, you know, it's a little bit of a, I, th I think some people have to kind of jump over that barrier a bit. Um, this is an interesting one. Michelle asks, uh, can our own gut bacteria convert from K1 to K2? 
Very little. Uh, and this conversion it, it was one of the reasons why we overlooked K2, because way back in the beginning of the research, um, scientists realized that there was some conversion in the gut and so figured, oh, well, if it's happening there, then that must be enough to meet our needs. But in fact, it shows um, that it's not the case, even though you can make a little for some people, uh, it is not enough to meet our needs and you still need it from your diet. And there's a lot of nutrients like that. We make a little bit of them in our intestine, some of the B vitamins, for example, but we still need to get them in through our diet. Yep. I, I think too, because our gut bacteria has changed so much that I, I feel that we've lost some of this diversity that can produce um, or, or convert the K1 to K2. But it's... um. That's true, although from what I've read, limited information available suggests that even our primate ancestors couldn't really do that and relied on K2 from, from dietary sources. And they clearly relied on the dietary sources. So it makes total sense that you need to eat it through your diet. Mm -hmm. Dr. K, Stefan asks, which is which form of K2 is best, lasts the longest and is best utilized? Plus, how much K2 do we need since it's a fat-soluble vitamin? How much do we st store? And he has a little comment there about natto. <laughs> yeah. um, so let me see. Well, how much K2 do we need? We don't actually know that yet. We, uh, in terms of uh, establishing, say, a recommended daily intake, that work is being done right now. And so we can't say for sure how much a person needs. It likely varies throughout life and depending on different health conditions. So in terms of, a, say, a minimum intake, actually at this point, hard to say. Uh, and just because it's fat soluble vitamin doesn't necessarily mean that we store it very much. And as a matter of fact, studies have shown that on a vitamin K2 restricted diet, people can become deficient in K2 in as little as seven days. And so it would seem that we don't store it very long. And what form of K2 is the best, long lastest, so, so longest or best utilized? So it would seem that um, as the size of the K2 molecule increases, its half-life in the body increases, so how long it stays with us. So the short chain forms, um, the MK4, for example, uh, seems to have a short half-life, passes out of the body quickly. The longer forms like MK7, 8, 9, and 10 seem to stick around longer. Um, so the, in terms of half-life, uh, you know, and I'm not saying necessarily either one or the other is better, but certainly the, from the fermented foods, that would last in the blood and the body longer. And just a quick, he just had a little add on here. Can K2 levels be tested? They still can't really. I mean, they are being tested and there's tests being used in academic settings, research settings. But at the time I wrote my book, I thought that uh, in commercial settings or available through your practitioner were just around the corner. And mm -hmm. it turns out there's lots of challenges and difficulties in getting a really helpful test. And it's still not directly measurable. You can't measure it like you would say vitamin D. Which is kind of frustrating, but there's still no data also on an upper limit, right? That there's not, there's been no published research on overdosing on K2. They have done studies on vitamin K2 in extremely high amounts and find it to be safe, like 45,000 micrograms, for example, and find it to be mm. safe. Now, that is not to say that everybody then needs to take that much, uh, but it certainly has been shown to have a very high safety profile. It's kind of a funny area because, yeah, we can't test it in people. So it's 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 going to take a little bit of time for, you know, the recommendations and so forth because there's still not not mainstream recommendations on K2, right? Where are we at with, with um, you know, rec like people understanding how much they should be taking in from the diet? So, so currently, I'm not sure if there is any country, possibly Japan, I should check on it, that is distinguishing between vitamin K1 and vitamin K2 in terms of their dietary intake or dietary guidelines. Um, I know in North America, and I'm sure Australia is the same, dietary intake or guidelines around vitamin K is just based on vitamin K1. And vitamin K2 is quite a different story. And so it doesn't really equate. And so in terms of mainstream information, that is lacking right now. And again, I know that research is underway, um, trying to establish that at least minimum intake. There are a variety of doses, dosing schedules being used in clinical trials. And the more trials they do, the more that gets narrowed down. Although those are typically for therapeutic uses and not necessarily general health maintenance. So. We'll talk about those dosages, 
dosages in a little bit in terms of maybe combos with D3 and K2, but I thought we, we might kind of go through the other, um, you know, we touched on it at the start, but what are the other things that K2 in the body besides mineralized bones and teeth and take calcium out of soft tissues? What, what is the research showing in terms of benefits outside of just healthy bones and teeth? Mm -hmm. So, well, the, of course, the benefits with regards to removing calcium from soft tissues has implications for cardiovascular health, um, as well as other things like heel spurs, kidney stones, you know, calcium can deposit in all kinds of areas in the body. So potentially helpful for that. As I mentioned, the research around cancer has really progressed specifically with um, prostate cancer. And we know as well lung cancer. So those are two big killers of men. So K2, potentially a very important nutrient for men for, you know, even just those two reasons. Well, between lung cancer, prostate cancer, and, and heart disease, those are uh, arguably the three major uh, you know health concerns for men and so so those are areas uh, as it's showing starting to show some anti-inflammatory benefits but that is one of the mechanisms by which it works in, in the diet um i wish that the dental health would catch up it it hasn't yet um but i would say those are the the, the big areas that were that we see studies coming out on there was a i'll send it to you there was a um a recent in published in January a study on uh, tooth loss and intake of K2. Um, oh, nice. Yeah, yeah. So it was kind of, the, I think it was NATO intake. Um, mm -hmm. but it, yeah, but it was kind of the first one that, that really kind of isolated that to an extent. Um, but yeah, it was still unfortunately, you know, a fair way behind. There, there's some stuff on the, the mechanisms of matrix GLA protein, for instance, and um, periodontal disease. But yeah, it's it's unfortunately lacking. Mm -hmm. I've seen some interesting studies in medical hypotheses about K2, the hypothalamus, and then uh, dental health. But again, that's it's still theoretical. And interesting, you, you say lungs too, because um, the, I've been reading recently a lot about the, the lung microbiome and how it manages cal calcium there. And actually, a lot of the problems mm -hmm. with, with the lungs is that there's this mismanagement of calcium with the connection to, to the kidneys. And so it makes total sense that when you're lacking K2, that if you can't clear calcium um, through the the interstitial spaces of the lungs, that you get this lung disease. And it's strange that you know that you know what Price was talking about is just going into every organ that were um, and, and and disease process. Cal calcification is sitting nearly in every disease process now. Yep. Yeah. You know, so so it your is. book, is, right? Like, like your book you wrote 10 years ago, you were saying, hey, this calcium paradox, well, it's playing out literally that nearly everything is a problem with calcium. And as a dentist, you know, we uh, like we're jumping up and down saying that your teeth are decalcifying. Well, this is this is happening over the long term elsewhere as well. It's crazy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And a few you, you're right. And anywhere you see calcium getting out of whack, then you know that K2 is potentially helpful, you know, worth a study, worth even a trial be because of its safety profile. We've seen that with rheumatoid arthritis. We've seen that with psoriasis. Um, and there that's, you know, that's one area where there haven't been any studies, but I've seen a whole body of um beneficial, well, anecdotal evidence, psoriasis has been a whole amazing, interesting story. But yes, you're right. So calcium is implicated in the mechanisms of so many conditions. And then that makes you wonder about K2. It definitely does. Okay. So we've talked about its role with, um, with calcium, but so you mentioned that vitamin D absorbs calcium. Can you talk about this, this kind of connection it has to vitamin D and what the trials are doing in terms of pairing them together and, and a lot of people are taking these things together what have you seen in terms of dosages and and how this works mm -hmm. we know that D and K2 complement one another they're partners in a number of ways so obviously the simplest way is D helps us absorb calcium then K2 directs it around the body but also at the cellular level we know that D will upregulate the proteins that vitamin K2 then goes and activates. And so that's really important to know because that means that by taking vitamin D, you are increasing essentially your need for and potential to benefit from taking K2 or having it in your diet. And so um, that's interesting, that's important. In fact, you know, we don't see problems or toxicity with D often, but when you do see that, 
then it is an excess calcification problem. And there are for, unfortunately some experts, I think I'm hoping that phase is passed because certainly I've stopped getting the emails, but recommending you know 100,000 international units of vitamin D per day, that kind of thing. And that is absolutely toxic um, because you will just absorb a ton of calcium. Uh, I got an unfortunate email from one gentleman who said he had been doing this on the advice of some expert for about six months and then had a massive heart attack, somehow survived it long enough at least to email me to say, my doctor said they'd never seen the amount of calcium around a heart as they had with mine. And so again, you don't see this except in this extreme forms, but that suggests that vitamin D and K2 work synergistically. K2 protects against any potential uh, toxic effects of vitamin D. Um, so those are some of the ways that they complement one another. What are some of the, um, so we mentioned, you know, very, very high dose. What are some of the, the common, because um, the, 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 in the last few years, you know, there's been a bit of research showing that our kind of our, our, our levels that we're taking for vitamin D is, is potentially too low. So what are you seeing in terms of how much people should be pairing with their vitamin Ds to, to K2s and, and whether they, they should be taking them together? Mm -hmm. So most of the research looks at nutrients in isolation mm. because that makes it simpler. Um, but that's not, of course, what real life is like. And so it's actually difficult to answer that question from the, you know, the perspective of the studies, because I don't think there are enough of yeah. them. Uh, but of course, there's this relationship. And when you hear about two nutrients in a relationship, you want to know a ratio. And so that's completely um, legit. And I then have sort of one that I've developed. It's a rule of thumb that I've been working by so far seems to be working okay. And that would be, and this is just based on, on supplementation for every 1000 international units of vitamin D you're taking in, that you're taking in roughly 100 micrograms of vitamin K2, by the way, that's in the NK7 form because um, that's last longer in the body. And I think that probably stands until up to about 5,000 D, 500 K2. And beyond that, I'm not sure. It's not clear. Do you need extra K2? What that, Does that ratio continue forever? Or, you know, once you get a certain amount of K2, all of those proteins are occupied and you don't need any more. For example, they're all busy with K2. So that is unclear, but that's the ratio I've been working is a thousand IUs of D for a hundred micrograms of K2. I mean, that makes sense, you know, that, and that it does become a bit blurry because obviously these things were packaged with food before and now we're kind of putting them into isolated forms. It's very difficult to know exactly. Uh, and there's obviously other factors too. Um, mm -hmm. What have you seen in terms of, you know, a little bit more of an unpopular conversation, but what in terms of vitamin A, because obviously it is a big kind of um, you know, contributing factor to with vitamin D, but where do, where do you sit with with vitamin A? And have have you changed a little bit over the years in terms of um, your view of vitamin A? No, I I still think it is a nutrient. I'm glad you brought it up because it's a nutrient that is really important, really misunderstood. For some reason, it's been vilified, and it still is. I think to a large extent, both vilified and misunderstood. So vilified in that somehow vitamin D could do no wrong and it's all fantastic where vitamin A is like toxic and scary and which is, you know, nonsense. And, and actually vitamin A and D are nutrients that complement one another. They are uh, like the gas and the brakes. And so if you take two in terms of, um, for example, K2 or calcium in the body. So if you take too much of either one, you will see problems. Uh, but if you take them together, then studies have shown at least the limited studies on animals that you can take them together in almost unlimited amounts and see no problems whatsoever and yet vitamin a has an undeserved bad rap uh, we also think we can get it from carrots and orange vegetables which we don't really properly convert and it's a nutrient that yes is, is underrepresented i think probably in our diets it, and it comes packaged too, you know. The big one is organ meats, um, where we, we where we find these these high concentration concentrations of retinol. Very mm -hmm. similar as well um, to the you know the K one to K two conversion, the, the beta carotenes in um, in vegetables. And so, mm -hmm. getting these active forms in the body is, is difficult, right? Um, it, have you seen any kind of um, any need in your practice for supplementation of vitamin A? Have you have you used that at all? If people aren't willing to eat a weekly serving of organic liver 
or uh, take cod liver oil, which is typically a, a good source of vitamin A, and that but it varies, you know, depending on the brand. Um, then if not, uh, I do like to see some vitamin A supplements pre-converted, so the retinol form, um, to balance out D supplements. And I think that it, vitamin A is another nutrient that's actually quite difficult to test for. You can't, unless it's extremely low or extremely high, there isn't a good blood test. Uh, the best way to test vitamin A levels is through a liver biopsy, which is not going to happen. Yeah. So so it's actually a, a nutrient about which I think we don't know enough. And we don't realize that I suspect that mild to moderate vitamin A deficiency is probably more common than we realize. Yeah, I think that's, that's very um, poignant because it's something that we've just, our eyes have just been off it for, for so long now. Um, mm -hmm. and it, but it, it, this is exactly going back to our starting point. This is what Price was saying is that these foods were rich in vitamin A and D and mm -hmm. this other thing that he didn't yeah, identify right. was K2. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, and we, it's just amazing how that kind of has been twisted in, in our, you know, to this, to let, this idea that it's toxic. It, it's a barrier former. It forms barriers in the body and, and the immune system and, and creates the ability to turn over bones and teeth. It's, it's pretty crazy that we've seen it in this light so look i'm just going to bring this up just because it's it's a little bit um uh topical today what are you seeing in terms of um are there issues with vegan or plant-based dietary patterns because all, all of the nutrients we're talking about are come from animal forms except for the fer fermented uh foods where they get the mk7 form of k2 are you seeing that there's an issue with um vegan plant-based dietary patterns? Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, if you are consuming natto, which is a plant-based food, you can absolutely easily get vitamin K2 and lots of it in a plant-based diet. Uh, that said, I, I do have to say that an unfortunate number of people have found their way to my work and my book because they were longstanding vegans that started to develop problems. Often it's the dental health that they noticed first. It can be other problems, but that's off. And then so they start doing research and they think, well, I'm following such a healthy diet. Why am I having these problems? Um, and then they realize that there are certain nutrients that they were missing in their diet by following a plant-based diet. Um, and that's what leads them to my work. So I've seen that a bit too often. And so I think there is potentially a problem. So if you're going to follow a plant-based diet, uh, you need to have natto in it. You navigated that question very well. It's it's, it's a tough one. Um, but yeah, I, I do think the what's missing in, in those diets are, are, are important, at least for people to know, right? Yes. And I mean, I think there's more potentially missing in the diets than just vitamin K2. There are just certain nutrients that are hard to get from plants. Um, yeah. in, and that is, you know, that's just the biological truth. Yep. So we've talked about cardiovascular health and, and cholesterols um, and, and so forth. I've, I've seen you post recently about um, the ways to, to, to control um, healthy blood cholesterol through, through, the, through your cardiovascular system. And mm -hmm. we've, we've talked about that, well, first of all, K2 and getting these nutrients are really important. But um, you're really good at bringing up nutrients that not many people talk about. So um, what what are, what are some of the um, factors that people should be considering if they're to control their, their um, blood cholesterol or they're concerned about it? Mm -hmm. Well, I guess the first question is whether they should even be concerned about their cholesterol. Um, because we know cholesterol and high cholesterol levels is a concern if they happen to be high in younger individuals, which is rare to see in people in their 20s and 30s. But as we age, in fact, the association between cholesterol and heart attack risk, for example, really diminishes, if not disappears completely, if not actually moves to an inverse. So for people over the age of 60, slightly elevated cholesterol is seems to be associated with a lower risk of both heart attack and dementia. Um, so that's important. But just because you have normal cholesterol levels doesn't mean you have no risk for heart disease or heart attacks. Uh, so to be proactive about heart health, there are other things that we sh should consider. So how else do we keep calcium out of our arteries in addition to vitamin K2? Magnesium is a really important nutrient. So magnesium and calcium, they're like you know yin and yang, they're a pair. Uh, magnesium will help to keep calcium in check. It's a nutrient that has become harder to get through our diets and it's the lower blood pressure, which is important for heart health. Uh, it's really important heart health risk factor and do all kinds of other great things. So magnesium is, is one. 
Um, Omega-3 essential fatty acids are foundational for good health in general, healthy lipid levels, healthy blood vessel and endothelial health, that's a lining of our blood vessels. And then, you know, cholesterol is really only a concern when it becomes oxidized. So that so-called bad or LDL cholesterol isn't really bad at all until it becomes oxidized. So make sure that doesn't happen by getting in antioxidants. Um, all kinds of anti different antioxidants will do that. Curcumin is one I like if you can get a high absorption form, but there's other ones that will keep your cholesterol from becoming oxidized. So those are some very simple things that we can do to, you know, for heart health that's more important than lowering cholesterol. Yeah, no, you've put that so well. Um, in, in terms of um, absorbing curcumin, how, how do you find um, better absorbing versus non-absorbing curcumins? So based on the research I've seen, you can give people heaps of standard curcumin and blood levels don't really change. So you need to do something to the curcumin um, to make it more absorbable. And once researchers found ways to make curcumin more absorbable, this is when the clinical work with curcumin really took off. And all of the clinical trials now are using high absorption forms. There's a few different ways you can achieve that. Um, and different brands will do this. There's, there's a sort of a handful on the market that do this well. Grinding it down to a tiny particle is one way to increase absorption. You can combine it with uh, a, you know, a number of ingredients will help to increase absorption. And so there's a, a few of those. Um, and that, that in, when you do that, and if you look at the clinical work around that, it can be a really helpful uh, nutrient to have in your diet. It, it, it's interesting. There's a theme here about getting the really active forms of a, of a, of a nutrient. Like it's, it's something that we haven't considered very well, isn't it? That there are forms of this out there, but how do you get how do you get it into you doing the right, absolutely the right things that nature has all these little tricks and pieces mm -hmm. that it's, it's put together, right? It, it's, it comes up nearly in every conversation. And I feel that's really kind of where things are progressing. It's like, well, there's this, but here's the really active form that you need um, to get plenty of so that, so that your body uses it properly. That, yeah, that's often the case because once we talk about, you know, extracting nutrients from their sources, then they may be absorbed differently. And then people, you know, this is where some people might say, well, why don't you just get everything from food? And I love that idea, except that, as you know, we've heard, we're talking about in some cases, unusual foods with K2, for example, there's a seasonal variation with magnesium, soils have become depleted, making it very challenging to get the amounts we need. And so we, in, in our modern age, we actually do need to rely on supplements and they can really make a big difference in our health. But there are often these, uh, you know, things to know. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I think, you know, as an adjunctive, it's it's nearly, um, you, you have to today, especially when you consider how deficient we've been in these um, nutrients for generations and, and what mm -hmm. effect that has. The mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and fortunately, some nutrients are, doesn't make a huge difference, but there are certain ones where it makes all the difference. Yeah, yeah. It's, it, and that's why, you know, people doing your kind of work is so important. Uh, Dr. Raymond, the, you... I saw an interview recently where you were talking about um, moods and how certain foods can can change your um, the mood of your brain. Can you, tell, mm -hmm. can you just give us a quick overview of the mechanisms of, of how diet can change our, our, the neurotransmitters in our brain and what we should be thinking about? Oh, there's so, you know, that was a little clip on a local news segment uh, recently and and what we eat has such a profound effect on our mood. And that I think takes two forms. The one form is eating certain foods that may be adversely affecting our mood, uh, whether that's because it's causing our blood sugar to fluctuate a lot. When your blood sugar fluctuates, your energy levels and mood will fluctuate with it. Um, or, you know, I, I came across a, quite an interesting paper that I'll send to you uh, that was entitled Bread and Other Edible Agents of mental health issues, <laughs> which was a good one. So there are certain foods that really we just don't do well with, as well as lacking nutrients that are support our mood. Uh, Omega-3 essential fatty acids are one of those, a really important foundational for mood. Uh, B vitamins are critical for mood, and uh, we, you know, some people need more of them than others or don't metabolize them as well as others. Uh, so getting those in through the diet are, are key. Those are probably the two main ones. But there are other nutrients that can help calm you down if you have the jitters. Alphenine from green tea is one that I love. Um, and it's amazing how much food and nutrients can really impact how you think and feel all day long. 
the B vitamins is an interesting one, yeah, because it, it's well known, um, you know, how critical they are. But there's so many, aren't there? So, can you just run us through a, a few of uh, the B vitamins and what they do? And and there's there's a um, there's also a synergy with vitamin D, right? With with the B vitamins. Ultimately, all the nutrients are interwoven, you know, of course, to, to one extent or the other. And the bees are uh, important for energy function. They help us convert the energy from our foods into ATP, the energy that our body uses. And they are, you know, ultimately, vitamins are cofactors for enzymes don't do everything in our body. And in terms of individual ones, well, specifically with related, you know, related to mood, B6 is a, an important nutrient for mood in general, but specifically for women, especially around the cycle that can really make a difference around the menstrual cycle with, with mood um, and energy production. B3, niacin, is also a nutrient that can be life-changing for certain individuals with low mood or depression that, uh, you know, those two big ones, uh, B12 as well, that can be involved with energy production, neurological functioning, low B12 levels are not uncommon. And some of the early symptoms of that are neurological ones like uh, forgetfulness and clumsiness, which people can think is just a part of getting older. But in fact, it's low B12 levels. I saw that with my dad, for example, when he was um, aging. And so, yeah, bees do a lot of different things in terms of mood and energy. They, they do a lot and they can be related to, so there can be a synergistic effect with vitamin D. Oh, and one thing I didn't want to mention earlier is magnesium mm. is really important for our utilization of vitamin D. And with everybody taking vitamin D, um, it's important to be aware that you need magnesium to make that work too. Great point. And what's your take on the best forms of magnesium? Honestly, so there are lots of different forms of magnesium on the market. I think there's two major ones that seem to be rising to the forefront or most popular, uh, popularly purchased, magnesium citrate and magnesium bisglycinate. And yes, I know that there are others and the magnesium keeners are going to weigh in on that and that's fine. I tend to generally go with magnesium citrate because it is cheap and cheerful, like it's inexpensive and consistently effective. Uh, but if for the people who find that they, that's, causes um, digestive issues that's sensitive on their stomach. Magnesium bisglycinate is a form of magnesium that is easy on the stomach, won't cause stomach upset. You will get most of the benefits that you want. There are specialized forms of magnesium that it would seem that perhaps are more beneficial for brain function. Uh, the research is still emerging, but those are the two main ones. And I just personally like magnesium citrate because it's, it's cheap and it works. <laughs> Yeah, we've got to be pra practical, right? It's um, mm -hmm. some some of the forms can be really expensive, and mm -hmm. as you say, it's super important. So you kind of need that's one of the su supplements that most people should be taking, right? So yep. you kind of got to be practical about it, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Doctor Room, I'd like to kind of round this out, like just kind of um, painting, you know, maybe a day of 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 foods um, rich in K two, and how so? What types of foods like do you eat? um to get your k2 and like how much k2 is would, would you kind of um you know estimate is in that food just to kind of give people an idea as to what oh, they're getting from their food and that, and and how that's much a great k2. question I, I never really stopped to look at it and that would of course vary throughout the season because in the yeah. summertime the egg yolks uh for example and Grass-fed butter, if you could find local grass-fed butter, it's not easy to necessarily to come by for us here, uh, would be higher in those things. It's a big difference in the egg yolks. Um, I do consume cheeses, and I specifically try to pick the ones that are high in vitamin K2, but that's not necessarily a, a daily uh, thing. And if I'm and I, I don't eat a lot of natto. <laughs> um, but uh, so so I often do rely on a supplement. I'm just trying to think on based on what I had today. I had this morning some boudin noir, which is so there's blood sausage. Um, oh, nice. So that's yeah. probably had some K2 in it, but uh, I wouldn't know how much at this time of year. And so because of that, um, I make sure that I, I, I take a supplement, to be honest, even on a day that I've had a lot of brie or, or whatever. It kind of runs alongside that um, the magnesium um kind of argument where k2 and and you know it 
it's very difficult to get you know price showed us that, that the modern diet is deficient in it so yeah it unless you're eating a lot of organs or a lot of you know really you know funky ferments all the time mm-hmm. you're likely not getting enough right mm-hmm. yep yeah one little um, vitamin D has, uh, has has been included in activating many, you know, thousands of genes through the body. Mm-hmm. Uh, and there's, there's a little bit of research showing that K2 is also um, activating, you know, our DNA in certain ways as well. Have you seen anything on this? Just a little bit of it. So the initial research suggested that K2 was just activating the proteins that are there to move calcium around. And it didn't have the same kind of hormonal action, in other words, uh, binding to our cells and activating DNA that we see with vitamins A and D. But that is changing. And there is some research emerging that K2 um, does have that effect to a certain extent. And so I am keeping an eye on the importance of that, you know, when that plays out and the emerging research uh, when it comes to that but it's interesting to know it's working in different ways yeah totally it's it's an amazing nutrient and you know you've done such a good job in throwing light out into the world into helping people understand it better how would you describe how the world has changed since you first published the book obviously you, f- you felt it was a very important topic to now like what have you seen that that's changed what needs to happen and what would you like to happen say in the next five to ten years Well, when you write a book on something, I think you assume that then everybody will know about it and then your work is done. (laughs) And yet here we are and not as many people know about it as I would have liked. And and in mainstream circles, for example, mainstream medicine or mainstream nutrition, it's still not very well known. And so thank you, by the way, for spreading the word and increasing awareness because there's a lot of work still to be done about it. So I guess I was hoping that awareness would have been a little further on by now, and that does need to progress. And part of that as well is it would be nice to see more research around it. Um, You know, vitamin K2 is still probably at least 20 years behind vitamin K Uh, vitamin D uh, in terms of research. And so we need that too to see it. But given what we know about its safety profile, I think that then there's no downside for people to be taking it or, or of course, increasing intake in the diet. Uh, But again, still needs more awareness. More awareness, more awareness. It's, Mm -hmm. it's, it's pretty fascinating, you know, that, that it's still, you know, a, a small amount of people out in society would have heard of it. So, you know, these conversations are very important. Your work is very important. Um, for people who'd like to learn more about you, uh, where can they find you? Mm-hmm. They can reach me at www.drkatend, for naturopathic doctor.com. And have you got anything in the works now? Do you take clients? What's your, what's your day-to-day now? My practice is on hold, but I am quite busy uh, with consulting and education work. And of course, a busy mom and (laughs) working from home like the rest of us still here um, in North America and always uh, researching and trying to keep up with K2. There's been some discussion with the publisher about the possibility of a, a second book. So we'll see. I think it's a must, to be honest. You know, so much has happened, and you know, I, I think there's going to be such a, a need for it growing. So, so I, I really hope you do do it, Dr. Raymond. Thank you so much for for spending the time with me today. I, I hope to do it again soon. And yeah, I just want to to send my heartfelt thanks out for all your work that you've done. It's helped myself to understand this as a dentist a lot better, but also to to lift the the consciousness of the planet that we need to be eating this food that was ancestrally connected to our bones and teeth. So thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure chatting with you. See you next time.